Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1971 film The Devils, which is getting a lot of traction on social media being talked about right now because it was just added by Shudder, and that's where I watched it when I'm doing this review. Uh, get on it fast because I don't know how long it's going to be on Shudder. Shudder has a tendency to have films just for a certain amount of time. They don't have any date on their uh, streaming service that'll tell you when these films will cycle off. And sometimes films are there for a long time. Sometimes it's really quick and they're gone. Now, I say that you, you should get on this one, not just because it is a good film, because it is a very good film, but also because it's very hard to get your hands on, apparently. Um, so much so that people are kind of like flipping out about it, actually hitting shutter and being like, get on this, watch this now. Um, so yeah, check it out. If for nothing else, then to just have seen it so that you know you'll never have regrets because you finally saw it. So this was directed by Ken Russell, who did some other film, many other films actually, but some key ones people might know are Tommy, uh, yes, the one with the Who music in there, which is a wacky film, Altered States, also crazy, and a very crazy film, uh, I need to go back and re-watch this one because I really didn't like it that much when I first saw it, but uh, I have a feeling I might feel a little bit different about it now, um, as some time has passed in my film appreciation. Uh, the Lair of the White Worm. Yes, Hugh Grant is in that one. A lot of people don't know that Hugh Grant was in a horror film. Uh, it was, this was written by um, Russell himself, actually. and was based on a play that was by John Whiting, which was based on a book by Aldous Huxley. Yes, Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World. Uh, and the book was called The Devils of Loudon, uh, which obviously makes sense because the city this, this takes place in is Loudon. Oh, and real quick disclaimer on this, just so people know, I am having spoilers in this. This is an all-spoilers review because it's an old film. I know it's hard to get a hold of, but I'm making it all-spoilers because I assume there will be enough people out there who end up watching it and then want to, you know, get a breakdown of some of the stuff in this film. I'll, I'll be unpacking the themes quite a bit. Uh, a scene where the nuns pull down a Christ statue and have an orgy with it was cut from the film. Uh, and there is an uncut version out there somewhere, but it's apparently unbelievably hard to get a hold of. It was on a, an uncut DVD version, and Shudder was not able to get that version of the film. So that scene is not there, the, the Christ statue orgy. Um, obviously, you can figure out in 1971 why that was cut from the film, because that is just, it's a lot. And for the time this film came out, it was a lot, especially from the religious standpoint of it. Warner Brothers had no interest in releasing a director's cut of this film, even though the footage that was initially cut, it was lost for a little bit, then it was found, and then Russell apparently was like, I would love to release a version of this that's director's cut so we can get this original footage back in there. Warner Brothers was like, nah, we're not interested in doing that right now, so whatever. Uh, the footage can be seen in a documentary on... Ken Russell. I don't know which documentary that is. I did some research to try and find it. I just found the information that it can be seen in a documentary about Ken Russell. And I, I was searching more and I couldn't figure it out. But maybe someone else can and you can put it in the comments. And then also, like I already referenced, that uncut version DVD, which I assume is impossible to find anywhere at this point because it was kind of a while ago and it was limited run and I'm sure people are not selling it. <laughs> Uh, Italy banned the film and actually even threatened to arrest um, Grenier, the, the guy who played Grenier, uh, Oliver Reed, and um, Redgraves, what's her name? I have it written in here later, um, who played Sister Jean. They threatened to uh, arrest them if they set, foil, uh, set foot on Italian soil, which I was like, wow, that's extreme. Steven Schneider, uh, who has written a book called 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die, included this film in his book. He said it's it's a must, so you can cross that one off your list if you're watching this and you've already watched the film. Originally, United Artists pitched the project to Ken Russell, but then after they saw what he wrote for the script... They dropped it, and then Warner Brothers picked it up because they thought it would be way too controversial. It was extremely controversial. This is apparently actually considered to be one of the most controversial films ever made. So United Artists was like, not touching it. 
but it actually did really well in the box office in the UK. I think in 1971, it was like the top grossing film in the box office. The other thing about this is, uh, even though it was super controversial and a bunch of places banned it, Russell ended up winning awards for his directing of the film. He won Best Director Awards for at the Venice Film Festival and also got an award from the U.S. National Board of Review. So, there you go. Oliver Reed, who played Urbane Grand Grandier, uh, and Ken Russell had a lot of issues on set, apparently, and apparently by the end of the film, they were barely speaking to each other. Uh, one of the big reasons, I think, is that Reed in particular said he had a hard time on the set. It was very cold. He actually ended up being sick at, at a certain point, but pushed through that to, to act. And Russell apparently wasn't very sympathetic to him. He was a very unsympathetic guy and was just kind of a jerk to him. So they did not get along. Just saying. On the other end of the spectrum, Vanessa Redgrave, who played Sister Jean, was said by Russell to be, quote, one of the least bothersome actresses I could ever ask for. He also made some comments about how she was very into the role. She threw herself all into it. And I think, think you can easily see that in the film when you watch it. She is one of the more standout performances in it. Obviously, Oliver Reed's performance is really great. But Sister Jean, I kind of feel like whenever she's on, on camera, she kind of steals the scene at what's going on. She really went all for that, Vanessa Redgrave. So great performance. But I, that, that gets to another thing, though. I think, in general, the acting in this was very exceptional. I didn't see any instances of people I was like, ugh, that's eh, acting. All the acting was really good. Some of it's done in a very ridiculous manner, like the guy who played, I didn't look it up, but Louis the Thirteenth, because he's not really an important character in here. I mean, he's important story-wise, in a way, but he's not in it a whole lot. And, yeah, he, he was just played as, like, ridiculous and over the top which i think was intentional script wise because they're trying to make fun of this political figure who was in control of the country at the time and obviously didn't really care that much about making the right decision like his character literally is just like consumed with his own private life like just basically having fun putting on plays partying in essence and doing just ridiculous over-the-top stuff and could really care less what's actually going on because these atrocities that happen in the film are occurring because he signed off on it literally after Cardinal Richelieu kind of approached him and was like, you know, this guy has a lot of uh, grandeur. Grandier has a lot of um, influence, and I think that that could end up leading to uprisings, and that could that could impact you. When actually, as we know, because Richelieu's bringing it up, he just feels threatened because of the level of influence that Grandier has within his religious position. So, yeah. The way they put gravity uh, and the particular music... Oh, I'm sorry. I actually skipped something. I need to go back to this. The Disclaimer. The disclaimer in the beginning of this film reminds me of something that um, people need to be very careful about actually reading the words in these disclaimers because, I'm not, not particular for this one, but in a lot of films it'll say kind of like based off true events or, you know, it has certain ways that they say things. Now this one in particular basically says that this is based in historical fact and that the major events actually happened and that is true like if you look into it you know Richelieu was a person Louis the 13th was a person Grin Grandier was a person he was you know accused of witchcraft and, and burned at the stake like these things did happen but the events in between and everything that gets fleshed out with the script is there's a lot of liberty there one of the other things is in the initial like play and the book the Black Plague wasn't even a part of this I don't even know if the Black Plague was going on historically speaking when this was going on so yeah you know, you just have to be careful with that. But that's just like a film in general. And actually, since I'm just talking about a disclaimer, I will throw out a disclaimer on my own for this video, which is I feel like this film can hit people in a very different way than it hits me personally. Because I am not a religious person at all. I have never had a religion. I've never practiced religion. And I will never be a part of any religion because it's just not something that I feel like is for me. But I recognize that there are a lot of people who have religion um, all over the spectrum. And for that reason, this film can hit you very, very differently. So I'm saying this as a disclaimer just to say that 
if there are things I don't bring up that you saw in the film that are religious based, I'm not, I'm probably not going to talk about them because I probably didn't catch them because I'm just not aware of that. And in that instance, go ahead and put a comment down there. Let me know. Hey, um, I know about this. I don't think you do. And, and here's the significance of it. I'm, I'm down to learn that stuff. So the way they put gravity, um, the create gravity uh, and particular music that they use on the statement, on that kind of like freeze of the statement that gets made in the very beginning between Louis the Thirteenth and Cardinal Richelieu, when Richelieu says to him at the play, something about that they want to fuse the church and state, basically bring them together in this kind of partnership. And they... They focus on it so much and create so much gravity in that situation, and especially with the music that they choose to use that's very like foreboding and ominous. It's important because that is important. That is probably the most important thing that happens that ends up leading to what occurs during the, the film because it's the coupling of religion and politics at that point. And it becomes the situation then where they don't kind of operate autonomously and Richelieu gets the okay from Louis the Thirteenth, like I already talked about, to basically do everything that happened after that in the film, all these horrible atrocities in the name of religion, but really for the reason of politics and the reason of personal vendettas are the real big thing. But I'll talk about that much later in it. Uh, the way all the nuns react to Urbain Grandier uh, when he shows up initially in Ludon is driven but seems to be really driven by fandom i think it's a way that they really set up how idealized he is how he's looked at as being so high up and that is then important to be, for for viewers to be able to see that because they can then understand why it ends up feeling like a threat to richelieu because of high, how high how high up he feels based off how people look at him but also it shows kind of like this fandom and it, and it has this oozing kind of sexuality to it as well it's very sexually charged uh especially when you know they take it even further like you you hear some nuns talking and one of them even comments about wanting to sleep with grandier and saying that it would be worth you know dying for in in essence and then you have the part where you know it goes even further and sister jean at one point like masturbates to the thought of grandier and yeah so so they work that aspect of the film in early on which obviously comes in later because in essence like this film has this underlying tone of like sexuality versus religion and the roles of like religious suppression of sexuality especially when it comes to people who are within the structure of religion like grandier because really what really sets that makes it possible for all the things that in the, that occur in this film to be set in motion is the fact that he has sex if he wouldn't be having sex, that may not happen. Now, maybe Richelieu would have found another way to kind of take his influence down. But in this particular instance, it all comes about because he has sex, particularly because he impregnates the woman that he's with before he uh, ends up marrying Madeline. Just saying. Uh, the scene of Grandier breaking things off with the woman he just slept with also shows that he is kind of guilty of some uh, sins, in essence. He is a prideful person. He kind of really does hold himself up there. And you see that in his character, especially in that scene right there. Um, he's having sex, which, they're, you know, according to the other people with this religion are saying, you're not supposed to be doing that. It's indulgence. Um, he's thinking of himself very highly, uh, obviously, and he's just kind of like throwing this woman away, really. It's terrible. He has a lot of pride going on. Um, but then it makes you wonder, like, is that what would eventually happen if he ended up living with Madeline? Like, we don't know. Um, but you see he's a flawed person, basically. He's, he is not the best. And that's where you see, like, the beginning of that contention. And it just, like, paints him as kind of like a real jerk, <laughs> like, very early on. But it, it's kind of a funny scene for that reason at the same time. Notice how Grandier seems afraid of nothing because the other thing is he goes out in Ludon when the plague is very, very much active and just unprotected, just getting very close to people who are inflicted and, or I'm sorry, afflicted and just whatever. Like it, it, it goes into the pride thing I was talking about with him where he really kind of 
projects himself as he feels like he's untouchable, as he is kind of holy in a sense and is protected by God in a way. The fencing with the crocodile. That's an unbelievably wacky scene. I definitely had to bring that up. I'm not going to bring up a ton of specific scenes because not a lot of them. It's more about themes and the overall story of this. But the crocodile fencing where the, the father of the woman he impregnated shows up and starts trying to fence him. And he picks up that like stiff dead crocodile. And it's like blocking the, the sword swipes with it. It's just over the top. It's wacky. It's funny. And there is a bunch of like over the top wacky funny stuff in this film, which I enjoy. I, I think it it has an air of absurdity to it, but the the actual events of what happens and the overall story that it's getting at is sobering at the same time. So it's this interesting dichotomy of it's nuts, wacky, and over the top, but it's also very important and serious and sobering. So... And it, I feel like it's hard to marry those things when you're making a film. So, a real achievement. Sister Jean's statements about why many of the nuns uh, are there actually speaks to the lack of religious devotion and actually speaks more to being forced into religious servitude because of a lack of life opportunities. And that kind of sets up something you end up seeing in the film, which is this difference between the people in power and the people not so much in power who are serving in their religious position. Um, Sister Jean says in her conversation that basically a lot of them aren't there just because they're totally devoted to religion. A lot of them were there because they feel like they were never, you know, good enough looking to actually get a husband. They, you know, were born into a poor family. They just didn't really have life opportunities to do much of anything else. So they just felt like they were forced into becoming nuns and serving this religion. So interesting. Louis XIII is played as a cruel, eccentric, and fully absurd person. He suffers no real-life horrors like the plague and remains insulated from common people. And that further shows why he ends up making decisions that he does. You know, he's never had to deal with real-life anything. He, he never does during the course of the film. And his life is absurdity, really. I mean, it's all these wacky plays... And when he's doing, you know, like bird shooting and it's like actual people in bird costumes, like it just shows how detached he is and how insulated his reality is. And even when he shows up for the events of what's actually happening in the film, he's only there for like 10 minutes or something and then just takes off. And when he's there, he treats it like it's it's spectacle, like it's one of his plays. And then he's just like, all right, peace out, whatever you guys are going to do. Sister Jean is so consumed with jealousy because of her extreme desire to be with Grand Grandier. I will talk about that more in a little bit, but that is very important to note. That's where everything triggers for her character and her role in all of this. Ludon becomes a focus of scorn due to Grandier's influential power and what that means to Cardinal Richelieu's power and Louis XIII's ability to maintain control, which is what Richelieu... In, um, convinces him of. Then there's the revenge sought by Baron de Labardement because of the impregnation of the woman. But I'll circle back to that stuff uh, at the end as well to kind of like tie it in a neat bow. But important to know now. It's interesting how calm and gentle everything is when Grandier is away for his marriage because they're showing the, the shots of like him with Madeline after they, when they've been married and then after they've been married, which I assume is kind of like a honeymoon period. And everything's very serene. It's very nice. It's very calm. Everything's great. And then they're cutting back and showing what's going on in Ludon. And it's just, it's anarchy. It's chaos. It's, I mean, insane. It's, it's out of control. And it's interesting because that shows that Grandier isn't causing it. Like he's not actively there making these things happen. But the fact that he was there is what kicked it all off. And the the fandom around him, which gave him the level of influence and what he said about Richelieu publicly in, in early part of the film uh, that gets back to Richelieu uh, as a challenge to his power. Um, yeah, it's crazy. And that, that all started because of they were taking the, the protective walls down around Ludon, which Grandier did not like. So, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. 
Oh, yeah, it's depraved and frenzied back at Ludon, is what I was going to say. Another thing about that. This is a great quote, and this kind of sums up the moral compass of the people who are following Richelieu in this film. Lucky bastard, it's not every day baby see daddy burned to death. Obviously, that's happening at the end when Grandier is being burned at the stake, uh, and they're holding the baby up from the woman he had impregnated, and... Literally, let me read it to you again. Lucky bastard, it's not every day baby see daddy burn at, burned at the stake, or burned to death. And, I mean, just let that sink in. Like, that quote, like, who would say that quote? Would it be an actual religious person? No. That shows you that that individual is not driven by, you know, getting rid of someone who was influenced by the devil. It was purely driven by the revenge that that man wanted because Grandier impregnated his daughter. Not only impregnated her, impregnated her, and then basically said, see ya. Just saying. After Grandier is dead, the conversation between Sister Jean and Baron de Labardemont is chilling. It shows how comfortable they are in the terrible things that they've done. Truly. Like, it's, everything's so frenzied in the film up until that point, but once Grandier is dead, everything really calms down. Like, there's no craziness, there aren't people yelling, there's not, like, wacky stuff going on, people naked, you know, running around. It's Everything's just calm. And then that's when you see this conversation happen, and it's so emotionless and just, like, like business that they're talking about how they basically set this all up and got Grandier killed because of their own you know, motivations, and you're just like, man, that's really messed up. That's really messed up. But I'll, I'll hit on that in a minute here. In the end, all the worst people got what they wanted. The father's revenge for the impregnation of his daughter. Sister Jean's revenge for Grandier not marrying her, because if you remember in the very beginning, she kept having these, you know, delusions of herself marrying him and being with him physically. And then you see the jealousy when she lashes out at Madeline, when Madeline came to talk to her. Um, I think she was giving back the book that she had lent her through, like, the grating. And then she, like, grabs her hair and is, like, pulling it and is just, like, yelling at her. Like, that's the jealousy lashing out. So you see that there. And then the third thing is Cardinal Richelieu for Grandier challenging his authority. So those three people basically came together to create the situation that happened that feigned a um, possession, well, not a possession, a, um, a perversion by the devil, basically, of, you know, them claiming that Grandier has been influenced by the devil and he's leading black masses and he's a witch and he's creating, you know, a whole coven of witches, basically. The film ending with the transition to black and white and showing the dead bodies on the wheels outside of the town... I think is an ominous and depressing statement on how the events have kind of left no hope. You know, when Grandier shows up, there's kind of this air of hope coming to Ludon. And when he's killed, you finish the film in this black and white and terrible look of hope leaving Ludon, in a sense, as Madeline walks away and you're just seeing dead bodies on those wheels, like you saw in the very beginning when Grandier was coming into Ludon. I think the other thing is it goes to black and white at that point because the other scene that was done in black and white was when they were showing, um, I think, Christ on the cross. And I think that was when Sister Jean was kind of having like one of her daydreams about that. It was it was Christ on the cross and then he turned into Grand Deer who then came off the cross and was like coming over to her. And so I think it's supposed to be a comparison between those to go to black and white to to flash back to that scene in a way and make that comparison of Grandier to Christ. And that also he, when he shows up in Ludon, he was kind of almost at that Christ celebrity status, for lack of a better way to put it, because of all the how frenzied everyone was about it. The directing and cinematography in this film is great. It looks so good, especially when you consider that it's from 1971. Um, so awesome. A lot of great camera movements. A lot of really cool movements of shots, the way they frame people. I do think that early on in the film, a lot of the shots of Grandier are kind of done 
from like a lower angle to make him look a little more high up and more like kind of holy in a sense and powerful and later on after everything starts going down they start showing more shots either right on or kind of angled down at him to kind of show his position changing within the context of the story the sets look really great as well and i love kind of the stark contrast they have between black and white within the film which are you know the white pristine look of Ludon versus all the people who dress in black. So visually, that's very striking, looks very great, but I think it's also kind of making a little bit of a point of the pristine kind of holiness of the place and the establishment versus the, you know, darker outfitting of the people within, kind of showing the separation between the foundation of the religion versus the people who are a part of it. Just the thought. Um, this brings up the issue of people like Grandier using their position and admiration as a way to kind of persuade people around them to do things that they don't want to do. You see that early on when Grandier um, not only has obviously talked this one woman, the woman he impregnates, into sleeping with him and being with him, uh, but also when he's trying to talk Madeline into marrying him. And she keeps saying no, but he uses all this logic and he uses his position and his closeness to God to say, well, no, it's totally cool. Like we can definitely do this. And, and here's all the scripture that basically backs that up. Like, this is why it's okay. So it, that's a real life thing. It really is that there are people who will definitely take a religion and take their position within a religion to serve their own means, to get what they want. It happens all the time, and this film obviously shows that quite well. And obviously with all the events that go on in it, with, you know, Sister Jean, like I said, uh, the, the father of the woman, Grandier impregnated, and Richelieu. They also use religion to get exactly what they want in their positions. All the scenes in this that feel crazy and intense are, in, are helped greatly by the large amounts of people that they have. There were a lot of extras in this film. And how loudly they participate in it, in it and how frenzied they are in their reactions and participation in the scenes of what's going on. Think about if there were a lot less people in those scenes that feel crazy and frenzied. It wouldn't come off the same. Just having a larger grouping of people who get loud, who participate in it, all, have all sorts of like wild movements and gyrations in it, it just adds to the confusion. It adds to the craziness. And I feel like that's very important for the feeling of the film because as things start getting going down a really bad path you feel as an audience member kind of like you're losing control just like the story's losing control that the people of Ludon are losing control that Grandier is losing control for sure especially because he's not even there and all this crazy stuff that's happening in his absence so just saying uh, really, it's sex that started everything. Grandier indulged in sex, but those involved in condemning Ludon took pleasure in the pain and suffering they dispensed in the name of vanquishing evil. So where Grandier was taking pleasure in the sex he ended up having in the name of his religion, because he said it was okay, uh, these people who show up under Richelieu, Cardinal Richelieu, we're getting a lot of pleasure in the pain that they were inflicting and the terrible things they were doing. You can see it. They're like giddy. They're having, they're taking pleasure in physically inflicting pain and also just the emotional pain as well. I mean, also go back to the scene of when they had rounded up all those nuns and it looked like they were going to execute them in that ditch in the woods. You know, they had all the guys with crossbows around them. You know, they were basically setting it up to put them in so much distress that they would just go along with whatever they wanted. That's how they got them to be a part of the main plan to um, have them act and say certain things like, oh yes, Grandier was, you know, teaching the teachings of the devil and holding these black masses and he is a witch. So, yeah. And then the last thing I wanted to say about this is Grandier follows his understanding of his religion and his relationship with God, whereas Richelieu's cronies follow politics and use the guise of religion to get rid of Grandier because his influence makes Richelieu feel threatened. So this, going back, that circles back to the thing in the very beginning that I said they focused on so much of 
the marriage of church and state at that point and how perverted then the relig religion becomes because of the influence of politics within it. And I think that is the main theme, the main point of this film. And one of the reasons that it's become so, or was so controversial. I don't think it's as controversial now, obviously, but yeah. So anyway, out of five stars with half stars in play, what am I going to give this film? It, it is really well done. I'm going to go ahead and peg it out of four and a half stars. It's not the perfect film, but four and a half stars, I barely ever give that out. So it's a big one. Definitely, definitely recommend it to people and tell them to watch it on Shutter while they can. Put some comments down here. How do you feel about the devils? Um, other things you see in it that I did not see in it. Uh, did you like it? Did you hate it? Were you in between on it? Did you think it was as crazy as everyone's been saying it is? online because i don't think it was i really don't think people are like this is crazy this is whacked out and then i watch it i'm like yeah i mean there's like craziness to it but it's not like crazy whacked out i don't know for its time it probably was though from 1971 but anyway do me a quick favor hit that subscribe button if you can and you can it's literally, literally takes a second that's your best way to show appreciation for any video i've ever done this one or any other one you don't repay me with money you repay me with being a subscriber also hit the notification bell because then that way you know if I'm putting up other movie reviews or unboxings or haul videos or whatever. Uh, but regardless, I appreciate you taking your time to watch this video, especially if you made it this far because this is probably my longest review video I've ever done. <laughs> but thanks for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.